thank you so much for that lovely introduction. That was wonderful. And thank you so much for having me today. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. I love talking to teachers. My main work um, for about 40 years has been uh, working in teacher education and um, working in K-12 schools. So I always enjoy talking to an audience of educators. So um, a number of years ago when my home state of Connecticut started uh, advocating structured literacy uh, methods. This was a state department of ed. Uh, I would ask my grad students, my night students, who were mostly all public school teachers or already working in schools, they were getting their masters, um, what they what their understanding was of, you know, what 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 does this structured literacy thing mean? And um, when I would ask that question, I would see a lot of eyes looking down and nobody wanted to make eye contact with me. And then one uh, during one class, a really brave student raised her hand and said, I'm not sure exactly what it means, but it's definitely a big thing in a lot of school districts. So I'm hoping that by the end of the session today, people will have a clear understanding of what structured literacy means and why it can be valuable, why these approaches can be valuable. The first thing I wanna emphasize is that there is not just one method um, or one commercial program that is structured literacy. Structured literacy is an umbrella term that refers to a range of methods and commercial pro programs, um, but all of these programs share certain types of content and specific instructional features. So certainly not every approach is structured literacy, and I'll try to draw some distinctions between SL and non-SL approaches during the talk. Um, so in the presentation, I'll explain the key content and features of these approaches, including some sample activities, instructional activities that would be used in these approaches. I'll contrast structured literacy approaches with more typical approaches to tier one literacy instruction, although I recognize that general ed settings can vary and you know there might be there, some of you might already be doing um, some of this kind of stuff which would be uh, great and um, nearer to the end of the talk I'll say something about the value of using structured literacy approaches in tier one settings. So the content of structured literacy involves um, components of language and literacy that are known to be important in learning to read and that tend to play a role in reading problems. So, um, so you can see these on your screen. They're phonemic awareness, which is awareness of and the ability to manipulate sounds in spoken words. Um, and that's a, an oral type of ability so once a child has, say, sounded out letters in a word, can they blend those sounds to mm -hmm. form the word? That's the phonemic awareness part. Or if you dictate a word in spelling, can the child hear the individual sounds in the word to, to transcribe them? And we know that that's a really important ability in uh, early reading um, and plays an important role in decoding and spelling. Phoneme graphing relationships, or what are what's sometimes called phonics, uh, has to do with children's knowledge of letter sound relationships, including letter patterns that are common in English, like SH, TH, CH, AR, ER, etc. Um, orthography is usually used to refer to larger spelling patterns and rules. So for the student to know that. Um, if a one-syllable word ends in a vowel consonant E, the first vowel will typically be long and the E will be silent. That's knowledge about orthography. Or knowing um, that in a short vowel word, if you hear a short vowel uh, in a short word with a J immediately after the short vowel, that's usually going to be spelled DGE, like judge, badge, um, you know, ridge, words like that. Morphology refers to meaningful word parts. Um, morphology, and so that would be like uh, not only individual words, but in, like important prefixes, roots, and suffixes. 
Um, and morphology plays a role in reading at all stages of learning to read, uh, but it starts to become especially important as children advance to multisyllabic words and they have to read words with these, more words with these meaningful word parts. Syntax has to do with sentence structure uh, and grammar, and that's important, again, as children advance in school to more difficult books that they're expected to read, they're more likely to have to read um, books that have long, complex sentences in them, and sometimes children who struggle in reading have trouble with comprehending these long sentences, which could be for a variety of reasons. And semantics is meaning at the word level, so vocabulary, but also at the sentence and longer discourse level, um, you know, passages, stories, books. So um, that's the content of structured literacy. Some instructional features of structured literacy approaches include explicit teaching of important concepts. Um, and skills. So children are not expected to infer important concepts and skills simply from exposure. Systematic teaching that follows a planned scope and sequence from easier to more difficult skills and concepts. Uh, there could be different sequences that are, you know, acceptable, but the idea is that you wouldn't expect children to read complex types of words if they can't read simpler words and they're not expected to write lengthy pieces of writing if they don't know how to write a correct sentence or correct paragraph. Um, in structured literacy approaches, you provide clear, targeted, and unambiguous feedback. And also in these approaches, instruction avoids overwhelming students with too many skills at once, or what Fletcher and his colleagues, colleagues say is um, instruction that minimizes the learning challenge. That might sound a little funny to educators' ears because we're always being told we should challenge students, but the idea with structured literacy instruction is not that children aren't going to ultimately learn challenging types of skills, but in instruction, you don't pile on all those skills at once. And I'll try to give you an example later in the talk of what I mean. Uh, some other features of structured literacy include attention to prerequisite skills. So for example, teachers would teach sounds for letter patterns such as SH, TH, QU before expecting children to read them in words. Or um, another example would be if the teacher is explaining an unfamiliar vocabulary word, the teacher would be mindful of using words children will know in the definition. Uh, sometimes this kind of instruction is typecast as, you know, boring, uh, you know, skill and drill type of instruction. It's important to note that it can be done in ways that are hands-on, engaging to children. Engagement, engagement is certainly really important because if children are not engaged in the lesson, as everybody knows, it doesn't matter how great your lesson is. So there are ways to engage children um, very much with this type of instruction. And um, also success is engaging. If children are learning and they're experiencing success, that also tends to help with engagement. Uh, in structured literacy, you would make purposeful choices of examples, texts, and instructional activities. And again, I will give you some examples of that later in the talk. The, uh, the letter tiles at the right are from the Wilson program, which is just one example of many structured literacy types of programs, but this type of activity would be used in a lot of different programs. So what about the phonics instruction in non-SL types of approaches? Um, when I talk about this sort of thing in schools, what I will hear from teachers or administrators sometimes is, um, well, we teach phonics, we teach phonics, and that's true. It's very rare these days to find a, a school where there's literally no phonics instruction. So in non-SL approaches, phonics is usually included, but it's often not emphasized even for beginners. So for example, in one very popular reading program, it's one of eight areas taught even in grade one, which is 
the grade that is arguably most, you know, critical for learning foundational skills. Often the phonics teaching is not very explicit or very systematic. So for example, in non-SL practices, instruction may present a wide range of different word patterns at once, such as stop, which is a closed syllable, make, which is a silent E, boy, which is a vowel team, or a diphthong, farm, which is a vowel R, when children can't yet decode simple words. Or as another example, children may be expected to spell words with common suffixes like needed and burning when they haven't yet learned to spell the base word. Initial phonics instruction in non-SL approaches may heavily emphasize the large unit approach such as word families. When my children who are long grown up now, but when they were young, they would come home with these rings uh, that would have word families on them. So there would be letter, there would be cards, word cards like back, tack, sack, rack, pack. And the children were supposed to practice the words, but they were basically learning the initial words uh, by sight. This kind of approach might not foster close attention to letter sequences and words, which is a key habit for beginning readers to develop. For instance, if you've used word families with young readers, one thing that um, you might observe is once children know what the rhyming pattern is, they just look at the first letter. Also, this kind of approach doesn't incorporate phoneme blending, which is an important skill. So just let me back it up a little bit and give you a brief digression on different approaches to phonics instruction, because I find that this is one of the things we used to talk about years and years ago when I was first in the field, but not so much now, and yet it's important for an educational audience. So um, three, three phonics approaches that people have outlined are, uh, the first is analytic or in implicit phonics, this is where you have an initial focus on whole words, but typically the words are highly patterned, like in the word families example. So it's supposed to facilitate the child's ability to induce the phonics. For that reason, sometimes this approach is also called inductive phonics. In an onset rhyme approach, the initial focus is on common onsets. The onset is the first in a one syllable word, it's the initial consonant or consonant cluster, and then the rhyme, which is everything from the vowel to the end of the syllable. So um, you children would learn you know, the sounds for single letters like N and S, and common digraphs and blends like SH, FL, and rhymes like um, at, it, ache, and ike. And then they learn how to blend those two parts. So to read make, they blend m, ache, make. Um, and then a third approach is synthetic or explicit phonics, where you have an initial focus on graph, graphene phoneme correspondences. So here's um, an example of the three approaches if the teacher was trying to teach children to decode the word shack. In an analytic approach, which is shown in the box on the far left, again, the child learns highly patterned words like back, pack, sack, and there's an expectation that the child will be able to infer how to decode shack by comparison with other words that are already known. In an onset rhyme approach, the child learns common onsets in rhymes, so then to read shack, the child blends the onset sh with the rhyme at, and you would focus on the most common onsets and rhymes. So for example, you wouldn't usually teach a word like learn in this approach because the, the rhyme earn isn't common enough to generate a lot of words. It would be rhymes like ack and ick and ache and ike and so on. Um, also, it's not really an approach. It works it can work early on, but ultimately when children are reading longer words, then they have to be able to transition to a different approach. In a synthetic phoneme graphing level approach, the child learns graphing phoneme relationships and how to blend phonemes. So for instance, to read shack, they learn that SH says sh, A in this position says A, and CK says K, and they blend sh 
ask to produce shack. Notice that this is a phoneme by phoneme approach, not a letter by letter approach. Letter by letter doesn't work that well for a lot of English words. So if you try to decode shack letter by letter, you would come up with something like s, a, k, k, which is not the word, right? It's phoneme by phoneme, not letter by letter. So what does research suggest about the kind of phonics instruction that is most beneficial? Well, research clearly shows that phonics should be taught explicitly and systematically. So explicit means the teacher models and clearly explains how to decode words, how to spell words. Systematic means there's a logical progression of skills with prerequisite skills taught before more advanced skills. So as I mentioned earlier, you teach simpler word types before more complex word types. With children who are really struggling, you might even start with certain sounds, like sounds that are easier to blend. The continuous sounds like mm, s are easier to blend than stop consonants like b, g, t. Instruction in phoneme awareness is also very important to include, particularly two skills, phoneme blending and phoneme segmentation. And research strongly supports integrating phonics instruction and instruction in basic phonemic awareness skills for children who know letter sound correspondences. If you're a preschool teacher, it'd be a little bit different. But if you're, um, you know, typically later kindergarten on, children know letter sound correspondences, it's helpful to integrate the two in instruction. Um, whatever approach is used for phonics instruction, as children progress beyond the earliest stage of reading, you always have to teach larger units such as common vowel patterns, vowel R patterns, and common morphemes. So um, what the research tells us is first, any phonics is definitely better than no phonics. There was an era when um, it probably, you know, for anybody that learned to read maybe in the late 80s or the 90s, there was an era when there was very, very little phonics teaching that was kind of a disaster for a lot of kids. We know that whichever of the approaches is being used gets better than having no phonics teaching or just purely, you know, incidental pick it up as you go, pick it up from osmosis. Um, now, the National Reading Panel was not really able to differentiate the different approaches that I showed you a couple of slides ago. So they were able to show that teaching phonics systematically is better than no phonics teaching. But they weren't able to say whether, you know, onset rhyme is better than synthetic at the phoneme graphing level, level et cetera. However, the National Reading Panel report came out over 20 years ago, and we've had a lot of research since then. Post-NRP research favors the initial graphing phoneme level approaches in which children learn letter sounds and blending over the larger unit approaches. And it's particularly an advantage for these approaches with regard to transfer skills, that is being able to read unfamiliar words or more complex types of words. So here's a sample structured literacy activity which illustrates this kind of approach, a synthetic phonics approach at the graphene phoneme level. Um, it's a word building activity with letter tiles, but it's done in a certain kind of way. So you use letter, letter tiles with letters and letter patterns that represent phonemes. In other words, if you're representing sh, you have one tile with sh on it, not don't put together an S and an H, okay? Because you're trying to get the kids to kind of map phonemes and graphemes. So that's why you do it that way. Only use letters and letter patterns children have been taught. And you form a sequence of words with unpredictable phoneme changes, not always the first phoneme in the word. The reason you want unpredictable phoneme changes is you want to force children to look at all the letters in the word which is a very um, 
adapt. It's a really good disposition to have when you're a beginning decoder to look carefully at words. Kids who have problems decoding often don't look carefully at words, but this is a technique that kind of gets them to do that and can be done in a way that is enjoyable for many kids. Um, obviously, you have to filter out irregular words from this kind of activity. So for decoding, the teacher forms the word with letter tiles um, and the child reads it. For spelling, you reverse that. So the teacher would dictate the word and the child uses the letter tiles to spell the words. You aim for a brisk pace in this activity. I keep looking online to find a good model and I'm never happy with the models because they're not fast enough, they're slow. You try to, obviously you can't push to a point where children are being confused, but if you structure it well, you can have a brisk pace and kind of a game-like activity that's really engaging for a lot of children. And um, what I've described so far with the letter tiles might lend itself more to one-to-one -to -one or a small group of children, but you can do the same thing as a paper and pencil activity, phoneme, graphing, mapping, and that would lend itself to larger groups. So in phoneme, graphing, mapping, you're using paper with a grid, uh, kind of like you would use in math, but a larger grid where children can write the graphings within boxes. So here's, um, here's an example. So um, imagine that these are letter tiles, or it could be a grid where children are writing for a spelling activity. And the teacher, and this would be, um, let me tell you first, this would be an appropriate activity for children that are maybe at an early to middle grade one level. So children that have learned uh, to decode CBC words, short vowel words with digraphs, and maybe who are beginning to learn how to decode short vowel words with blends. So the teacher forms the word and says to the, to the child, um, you know, what's this word? And if the child has trouble sounding it out, the teacher points to the letter that the child got wrong or gives appropriate feedback. Then the teacher says, okay, now I'm gonna try to trick you. What's this word? So the teacher does sip to sap or something, you know, something like that. It could be sip to sit, um, but you're making a single phoneme change in the word. Um, how about this one? Sap to snap. How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? So notice with flash, because the, um, the sh is a single phoneme, the sh is in one box or on one letter tile. And this is only showing you the beginning of the activity. So in a well-structured activity with well-chosen words, you could easily do, you know, probably in 10 or 15 minutes, 20 or 30 words. Flash, uh, flash to flush, flush to slush, slush to slug, slug to slump, etc. cetera. Um, but notice a couple of things. You're not doing sip to lip to hip, to tip, you're, you're varying the phoneme that you're changing in an unpredictable way. So the child has to look at the whole word. Also, you're not gonna do sip to sir because sir is a vowel R, the vowel sound changes and that's gonna be confusing for the student. So this is a good illustration of um, purposeful selections of word examples. Word choice, example choice is really important in structured literacy teaching. Uh, so, sort of to move on to another somewhat different topic, structured literacy practices do not use multiple cueing systems or sometimes called MSV models of reading, which have strongly influenced traditional tier one literacy instruction. So uh, just a little brief background for anybody that's not familiar with the model. It's based on the work of Ken Goodman and others. The claim of the model is that children become good readers by using multiple cues to read words. And notice I've underlined to read words because I'm gonna make a distinction later. Uh, so the multiple cues are visual or graphophonic cues like letter sounds semantic cues, in other words, meaning, and syntactic cues or sentence structure. And so if in this approach, if children come to a word they can't read when they're reading text, 
they're encouraged to use partial letter cues like the first and last letter of a word coupled with a picture or sentence context rather than first looking carefully at all letters to decode. We do want children to think about meaning while they're reading, but the point is if they stumble on a word, you want them to apply their phonics skills first and then think about whether the word fits. Um, here are some examples of commonly taught multiple cueing strategies for uh, word reading. Eagle eye, use the picture, get your mouth ready for the first sound, and skippy frog, which is to skip the word, read to the end of the sentence, and then hop back and read it, which is a clear direction to use sentence context. This comes from Emily Hanford's wonderful piece, At a Loss for Words, which I would strongly recommend reading if you haven't read it already. Hanford is a journalist who writes about educational issues. She's, she's not an educator and she's not a researcher, but she's um, really talented at writing about the research for a general audience. So, um, so she has some you know, very good points about this. Um, decades of scientific evidence shows us that good readers do not rely on multiple cueing systems to read words. This is like we know that smoking is bad for you. This is on that level, <laughs> that order of magnitude. Good readers do not rely on multiple cueing systems to read words. It's the bad readers, the poor readers, who tend to rely on context to read words because they can't decode quickly and, and automatically. And so therefore they rely on contextual processes. Children who are making good progress in reading in the primary grades don't have to rely on context because they have strong decoding and they can just read that word already. So why does this matter? Because as Hanford discusses, when she tried to talk about this with teachers, many teachers said, well, so what? Isn't it good for kids to use multiple cues? And why, why is it a problem that kids rely on context? Here are some reasons why it's a problem. Encouragement to guess at words in decoding tends to distract children from close attention to the print. This is very problematic for developing skilled fluent reading because developing skilled decoding in particular is about looking carefully at words and noticing letter sequences in words. Another issue is that guessing based on context doesn't work well for advanced types of text. So it might work when you're reading, you know, a first grade level book with lots of pictures, but it doesn't tend to work well when you're reading a, you know, a fifth grade chapter on Denmark or something like that. Even if phonics is being taught well in one part of the reading curriculum, if children learn to guess at words when they're reading text, this will tend to undermine their reading progress. And after all, the whole point of learning phonics is to enable children to be able to read books and have good comprehension. And so if, they, if, if the phonics teaching kind of goes out the window when they're reading text, that's, that undermines the whole um, program. Guessing at words, as Barbara Foreman and her colleagues point out, uh, guessing at words based on context cues can become a really hard habit to break. It's especially problematic for children with decoding difficulties, such as those with dyslexia, because those children are already kind of over, they are often already inclined to over rely on context because of their weak decoding. Assessment practices that are associated with MSB models, such as ignoring contextually appropriate miscues, are also problematic. So here are two different approaches to scoring text reading errors. In non-SL practices, not this isn't, you wouldn't see this on a standardized test typically, but in on informal reading assessments, in non-SL practices, teachers are often trained to overlook uh, so-called contextually appropriate errors such as a for the, this for that, mom for mother, and so on. 
these kinds of miscues are viewed as unimportant because so the, the reasoning goes that they don't greatly alter meaning. Keep in mind the very word, word miscue comes from MSV. It's the idea of multiple queuing types of systems. In structured literacy approaches, by contrast, with very few exceptions, all word reading errors would count. The exceptions are errors due to articulation, dialect, foreign accent. So, for instance, if a child reads R A B B I T as wabbit, because that's how he or she talks, that would not typically be scored as a decoding error. Or if a child who speaks dialect reads the word with as with, because that's how they talk, then that normally wouldn't be counted as an error. But certainly um, errors like off for da and this for that would be counted in an SL type of approach. And that's because we know that accuracy is a prerequisite for fluency. Children can't build fluency if they're not reading accurately first. Also, minor errors do affect comprehension, uh, as Don et al. showed in their study with fourth graders. Um, and, and that, you know, think about it this way, like that's particularly true in more advanced types of texts like children would be getting in third or fourth grade and up. So for example, a book could be any book. The book is referring to a particular book, most likely back somewhere else in the text. So children aren't gonna make these connections in more advanced types of text if they're making all these little word reading errors. Now, one thing that's really important here is to distinguish using context cues to read words as opposed to to aid comprehension. So consider um, a sentence like, or a couple sentences, Mary has two cats. When they go to sleep, they like to snuggle up to each other. And snuggle is the problem word. So a child can't read the word snuggle so she uses the first couple of letters combined with the picture and or sentence context to try to read the word. This is using context to aid decoding. That's, that's the one you have to be careful about as a teacher that you don't, want, you don't want to encourage children to guess based on context cues at words in decoding. However, there's another use of context. A child can read the text, including the word snuggle, but doesn't know what the word means. She uses sentence context or the picture to figure out that the word means to move into a warm, comfortable position. This is using context to aid comprehension. Good readers don't rely heavily on context to aid decoding, as I mentioned earlier, but they do use context to aid comprehension, such as to figure out unfamiliar word meanings or multiple meanings of words like fly meaning an insect versus fly to fly an airplane. So encouraging kids to use context as an aid to comprehension, that's fine. Context is um, not always supportive, but if children are reading something and they don't know what a word means, and there is a picture that might help them figure out what it means or sentence context, that's, that, is, that is fine. The thing you want to avoid is, um, is encouraging use of context to guess at words in decoding. Um, here are, here's a little section about sample text choices in structured literacy, and this would be for children's reading. So structured literacy practices involve purposeful selections of text. For beginning decoders and older poor readers who are functioning at very low decoding levels, st structured literacy approaches generally use decodable text, words that are texts that are controlled to certain phonics patterns. Um, poor decoders at more advanced levels, like for instance, a fifth grader who decodes at a third grade level, those children don't usually require decodables because they've reached a level where they can decode enough different word patterns that they can function in more natural text. However, children still need to be placed at an appropriate instructional level or around 90 to 97% word accuracy 
depending on the student's grade level, lower for younger kids, higher for older kids. Um, and that's often for poor decoders, that's not going to be their grade placement. So, but they can still read the fifth grader who decodes at a third grade level might be able to read an instruction, you know, a children's trade book that's at a third grade level or something like that. They not, don't necessarily, they don't typically need a decodable. Um, in structured literacy, texts are also purposefully selected with regard to comprehension demands. So, for example, if children have learned um, the comprehension strategy involving summarization, then the teacher would be using a text that lends itself to that. Or if a student has significant weaknesses in syntax, a text with simple sentence structure uh, for students who have significant syntax syntactic weaknesses. In non-SL approaches, beginners are often placed for text reading in predictable level texts. These texts are problematic because they usually contain many words that weak decoders are unable to decode. This doesn't give weak decoders opportunities to apply their decoding skills in text reading, and it also tends to foster a habit of guessing at words based on pictures or sentence context. So let me show you an example of what I mean. This is from a leveled book called Maria Goes to School. It's from the Reading A to Z books. Um, and this site also has some really good decodable series. So there are some, some series that would be useful, but I'm zeroing in on the predictables and I'm gonna argue that those are problematic. But before I do that, I'm gonna open my closet door for my cat who's driving me crazy picking at it. Just give me one minute. Are you happy? Okay. So sorry about that, everyone. She's doing pick, pick, pick. And I very distracted. So, okay, so here's a leveled book of the type that you might be using very early in reading instruction, say uh, kindergarten or early first grade. And the text has a line of print under each picture. And you can see that what's predictable is that there's repetition and also the picture helps you guess the word. So I get my backpack is paired with a picture of Maria grabbing her backpack. I get my pencils, which shows Maria getting her pencils. I get my ruler, Maria with her ruler. I get my eraser, Maria's getting her eraser. I get my crayons, picture of crayons. I get my sweater, picture of sweater. So here's what's wrong with this. A beginning decoder is not likely to be able to decode words like eraser, crayon, sweater, and so on. And the way the text is structured is it clearly encourages children to look at the picture and guess rather than look carefully at letter sequences and words. And I think this is an implicit message children get, even if as the teacher you're not saying, look at the picture and guess, um, it's kind of, it, it, you know, the unspoken message that the child is getting from the text in order to be successful is to guess at the word. Uh, also, the words don't have any phonetic control, so it's not giving children who are at an early decoding level practice in applying their decoding skills to text reading, which is a really important part of, of phonics instruction. Um, by contrast, in a structured literacy approach, beginning decoders would read texts that provide a good match to the decoding skills they've learned and that do not encourage guessing at words. So here's an example of a beginning decodable. I used to use this series with my, when I was um, teaching undergrads, I did a field work program where they would tutor children in the local public school under my supervision. And I had bought some of the uh, right skills decodables with a small grant for them to use because all it was a great school, but all the books they had were predictable and were really not good for children with decoding problems, especially. So this is from a book called The Red Fox Cub. And um, you can see and it's a similar level to the Maria text, but you can see written very differently. So there's a lot of CBC words, which is the word pattern children would usually be learning at this point. Words like den, fox, dog, it, cub, red, mom. 
There's some um, sight words, but you pretty much can't write a sentence in English without some sight words. So this, the children are getting practice in applying decoding um, much more so than in the other texts. And you can see that there's a really nice picture here of a cute little fox cub, but the picture is not used in a way that really helps children guess at the word. They still have to be able to read the words. Structured literacy approaches also use teacher read alouds of age appropriate children's literature and informational texts to help develop important language comprehension skills that underlie literacy. Read alouds are coupled with explicit teaching of these language areas, such as vocabulary and background knowledge. The explicit teaching is what makes it structured literacy. If there's not the, expl the explicit teaching going on, then it's not you know, really a structured literacy type of approach. So here's a sample structured literacy activity involving read aloud text. Um, and this comes from a book called Julius Baby of the World, which is one of my favorite children's books ever. It's about um, sibling rivalry. And um, it's by Kevin Hanks. And so this would be a good read aloud choice for third grade students who have weaknesses in decoding vocabulary knowledge and syntax. So here's from a selection from the book. Before Julius was born, Lily was the best big sister in the world. She gave him things, she told him secrets, and she sang lullabies to him every night. After Julius was born, it was a different story. Lily took her things back, she pinched his tail, and she yelled insulting comments into his crib. So why is this a good read aloud choice for explicit vocabulary teaching? for the students described earlier, students who are poor decoders and also have vocabulary weaknesses. Well, first of all, it's an amusing, relatable story for third graders and it's got rich vocabulary, words like insulting and lullaby and secrets um, are you know, words that would be uh, words you, that a lot of third graders wouldn't know and especially third graders with vocabulary weaknesses. Also, um, this, if you look back in the PDF, you'll see it uses very easy syntax. The sentences are short and straightforward. They're not, you know, a lot of complex or confusing sentences. The book is a good choice as a read aloud because that then, as the teacher is highlighting word meanings and teaching them explicitly, the children can focus on learning the vocabulary, the word meanings, and not on decoding, having to decode the words. So therefore, students will not be overwhelmed with too many demands at once. Of course, we still want to address the student's need for decoding and syntax instruction, but that would be through other activities in a different part of the curriculum, not all at the same time. So this is an example of instruction that minimizes the learning challenge. In this activity involving the read aloud, we're just focused on having children learn the vocabulary. Structured literacy approaches also prioritize time for teacher-led instruction. So this doesn't mean that 100% of classroom time involves teacher-led instruction. That's kind of problematic, especially if you're a general education teacher and you want to do differentiation. But in general, large blocks of classroom instructional time would not be devoted to things like sustained silent reading. This can be problematic, especially at early grade levels and especially for the weaker readers in a class. So now I wanna highlight another important distinction, just like the distinction about context is sometimes, you know, arguments in the reading field sometimes shed more heat than light, but the nuance, the distinctions are important. So the distinction is between encouraging free time, independent pleasure reading, and devoting substantial amounts of classroom instructional time to silent independent reading. We know that children derive many benefits from independent pleasure reading. For example, uh, independent reading can help children build their fluency, encounter new vocabulary words, and build their background knowledge. So it's certainly good for teachers to encourage independent pleasure reading. 
Um, and examples of ways teachers can do this is provide ample choices of text, um, make interesting and appropriate text available to individual children, assign and guide independent reading as homework, encourage independent reading as a free time classroom activity, or develop book groups, especially with older children. Um, however, classroom instructional time is limited and poor readers often need substantial amounts of explicit systematic teaching to progress. Many poor decoders also need to read text aloud with a teacher or a partner. They're not necessarily ready yet for long stretches of silent reading. What they sometimes end up doing is just you know, staring at the picture or picking a book that's much too hard for them that if you observe them, you know they're not reading. So um, children, the, the reading part, the application of phonics skills to text reading is really important. But when children are at that stage where they're still kind of struggling with the, with the code, they often benefit more from reading, you know, ideally with a teacher, but at least with a partner um, and not just reading silently. So for these students, especially prioritizing a substantial block of instructional time to silent reading is not a great use of time. Structured literacy approaches also teach higher level aspects of language, such as reading comprehension and written expression explicitly, systematically, and with attention to prerequisite skill. Um, sometimes people think structured literacy approaches are just about teaching phonics, and I know I did spend kind of a lot of time talking about phonics, but it's really important to know that these approaches also can be used to teach higher level aspects of language. And that's really important if you teach you know, beyond the earliest grades or if you work with poor readers at later grade levels who will often have difficulties in these higher level areas. So um, here are a few examples of structured literacy activities for sentence comprehension and writing. Sentence combining is one uh, really good activity. So this is an effective activity for teaching children how to write good sentences, grammatical sentences, and it can also promote sentence comprehension. The teacher starts by modeling practice examples with kernel sentences. So children get a set of kernel sentences that are short sentences, and then the task is that they have to put they have to write a, a grammatically correct sentence that uses all of the kernel sentences. But you start with sort of a decontextualized practice because that's easier, right? That's again, uh, one of the features of structured literacy. You start with just this one thing you want them to focus on and then you build up toward application. The ultimate goal is for children to apply sentence combining in editing their own pieces of writing. So here are some sample kernel sentences. Brian has a yellow dog. The dog is a Labrador retriever. The dog loves to play Frisbee. And so um, those are the kernel sentences. And then there's more than one correct combination that children could come up with. So they could come up with Brian's dog, a yellow Labrador retriever loves to play Frisbee. Or Brian's yellow Labrador retriever loves to play Frisbee. Or the yellow Labrador retriever who loves to play Frisbee is Brian's dog. But it's got to use all three sentences. So Brian's yellow dog is a Labrador retriever would not be acceptable because it doesn't use the last one. And Brian has a yellow dog and it's a Labrador retriever and it loves to play Frisbee, also not acceptable because it's not grammatically a good sentence. So you can kind of see how once children know how to do this, they can then apply it to looking at sentences in their own writing and combining shorter sentences, um, correcting incomplete sentences, things like that. The opposite of sentence combining, sentence decomposition, also can help children who are struggling with syntax and reading comprehension. So suppose that fifth graders are struggling to understand a syntactically complex sentence with a center embedded clause, such as the British troops bearing muskets and wearing their scarlet uniforms gathered at the border just before dawn. So the reason this is a syntactically difficult sentence is, is that it's got that 
that clause bearing muskets and wearing their scarlet uniforms that separates the main subject and verb. Okay, so um, common that children would have difficulty with this syntax and particularly children who already have syntactic weaknesses. So the teacher can use sentence decomposition to help students understand. You can break the sentence down into three main thoughts. The British troops were bearing muskets, they were wearing their scarlet uniforms, they gathered at the border before dawn. There's more than one way to decompose a sentence, just like there's more than one way to combine sentences, but the main point is about the British troops gathering at the border. And the center embedded clause is really just describing the troops. And um, the teacher could pull difficult sentences from the text that children are reading, syntactically difficult sentences, write them on a whiteboard, and uh, use whiteboard practice like drawing an arrow. So something like this. The teacher brackets off the, um, the, the center embedded clause and shows children with an arrow how troops gathered is kind of the main idea of the sentence. Um, here's just a little bit on some ways to differentiate tier one instruction for students with varying needs. And that would be, this would be, you know, a little bit different depending on the grade level. So for a grade one teacher, possible differentiation might involve two, two small flexible groups, a group of children who need extra practice on phonemic awareness and basic decoding skills, and a small flexible group of children who need extra work on vocabulary development and background knowledge. And some children might participate in, in both groups because they have needs in both areas. And you would want to incorporate structured literacy types of activities for each group. Now, at a, at a grade one level, there's probably going to be a lot more children in the first group, the phonemic awareness and decoding group. Um, but if you see children who seem to have weaknesses in vocabulary, even if they don't have decoding problems, it's, kind of to tr it's good to try to address that early. Grade four, you might differentiate um, in, a, in a different way. So a small flexible group of children who need extra practice on decoding multisyllabic words, because that's the differentiation is kind of based on hitting the largest number of poor readers that you can. So in grade four, you could certainly have children who are still working on, you know, CBC words. Um, we hope not, but that could happen. Um, but there's not going to be too many of them. You're going to see more children who need work on decoding uh, longer words. So it would make sense to have a group for them, a group for children who need work on vocabulary, background knowledge, and or inferential comprehension now that the books are getting more difficult. And at this level, probably those groups might be more equal in size um, or at least less of a difference between them in terms of number. Again, some children might participate in both groups and you would wanna incorporate structured literacy activities for each group. I'm, I'm not suggesting by the way that you shouldn't try to meet the needs of children who are um, you know, very, have very low skills, but in terms of how you, how you want the system to be organized, it's, it, it makes sense that you look at the kids who need extra help in terms of what the most common need is. So the most common need for a lot of kids in grade four, if it's a decoding need, it's often going to be for longer words. If it's different in your school, then you do it differently. You still try to meet the needs of kids who are more maybe are outliers in terms of their performance, but for that, um, you know, going to a tiered intervention or even if a child qualifies for special education might be a way that that child's need um, needs to be met. So um, to wrap things up a bit here, why, why the use of structured literacy is especially important for at-risk and poor readers. Um, structured literacy approaches directly target the core problems in poor reading, which are various components of language and, and literacy also, such as phonics. Um, we know a lot now about the difficulties that underlie poor reading. So they're not, you know, using multiple queuing systems to read words. They're not attending to the outer shape of words, like word configurations. They're um, 
things like phonemic awareness, phonics skills, syntax, vocabulary, areas like that. Um, structured literacy avoids undue frustration in learning, which is important for children who may have already experienced a lot of frustration if they're, if they're poor readers. And notice I say undue frustration. So I'm not suggesting that you can or should eliminate all frustration in learning. Children do have to learn to tolerate a certain amount of frustration in learning if the learning is going to be optimal. But if a method is being used where there's very little explicit teaching or a lot of skills are being piled on at once, it's especially frustrating for the poorer readers who have often already experienced a lot of frustration. So that's really not desirable. <laughs> Structured literacy provides explicit systematic teaching that's efficient as well as effective, and efficiency matters when children are behind and progress needs to be accelerated. Um, so a little bit about how structured literacy practices in tier one can be beneficial. Incorporating the content and certain features of structured literacy into tier one instruction could help many students, not only those who have been formally identified with reading problems. So it, many teachers know that, you know, for every student who qualifies for the in supplemental intervention or special education, you have other students who don't quite make the cutoff, don't quite, you know, make eligibility criteria. Um, and yet could really benefit from the same kinds of things. So um, incorporating some of the features like explicit systematic teaching, purposeful choices of instructional texts and tasks could be really helpful to those children as well. Um, Fletcher and colleagues conclude that this kind of core general education instruction can be preventive of reading difficulties in some children. So a child that would have otherwise had a reading problem, might not have a reading problem with this kind of core instruction. And there's still going to be children who ultimately need tiered interventions or special education, but even these children will benefit because they're less likely to learn maladaptive strategies such as guessing at words and decoding, and also less likely to have accumulated a big deficit by the time they um, are eligible for intervention or services. Thank you so much. Um, this is my email. If um, anybody doesn't get their question answered during the Q&A and you want to contact me, please feel free to do that. Awesome. Thank you. That was uh, just a ton of uh, really great information. I was furiously taking notes uh, through the whole uh, presentation. I'll definitely have to go back and review. Um, just uh, one question that popped up a little while ago, watch it maybe just come back to, there's some discussion in the chat, um, but uh, would love to have you jump in. Talking about the multiple queuing systems, the question arose just about like, how does that apply to English language learners? So uh, uh, the comment was, there's some contradictory information on multiple queuing systems when teaching ELs to read in English. Um, if you could clarify, that would be helpful. Um, you know, I'm not aware of research that would um, support the, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out here how to see everybody's faces because I would like to be able to do that, but I'm having trouble getting it on my screen. Let's see. I think if you stop sharing your screen. You oh, okay. To... Thank you. That's great. There we go. There go. Okay, good. That's much better. Um, I'm not I'm not aware of research that shows that relying on context is you know that there is a difference for ELs versus monolingual English speakers. Um, I definitely think that there are some special considerations for English learners. So you can't take for granted that English learners will know the vocabulary of you know any book whether it's the an uncontrolled type of text or a um you know a decodable type of text certainly most english learners will benefit from explicit teaching in vocabulary english vocabulary academic language um, we certainly want them to after they've made an attempt at decoding a word to think about meaning 
and to self-correct if that if the word doesn't fit. So, you know, if a child decodes, say, quit for quilt because they missed the L, the feedback the teacher really should give first is point to the L and get the teacher, get the child to attend to the L. Then if the child corrects it, the word fits, the teacher can ask a question like, does that make sense? Or if the child just keeps reading, the, the teacher could encourage the child at that point to think about meaning if the child keeps reading after reading quit. But that's not really anything that I would do differently for a non-EL, uh, you know, a non-English learner, a, a monolingual English child. I would do the same kind of thing. We want, it's, it is kind of a subtle distinction. So it's a distinction between, um, in SL, you want the kids to look carefully at the print and apply their decoding skills. You want to place them in books where they can decode, right? Because if they're reading texts where the words are too hard for them, then they have no recourse but to guess. But you also want them to comprehension monitor. That is, you want them to think about meaning while they're in the act of reading. And so if a child reads something and it doesn't make sense, we do want them to go back and look more carefully at the word, try to decode it, and then see if it, if it fits. But again, I'm not really seeing how any of this would be different depending on whether the child's an English learner or not. You know, the English learners have additional considerations in terms of what you need to address in instruction like vocabulary, but not so much for the queuing systems thing. I think it's the same for them. Great, thank you. Yeah, and we have, we have another session following this one. If you want some more information on English learners, we have Dr. Samford and Dr. Esparza Brown will be presenting on um, their uh, their systems and model demonstration grant around what they've found uh, to support English learners. Um, I want to give people a chance. I, I have a, a few questions, but I want to give uh, some people a chance to think about. You can type your question in the chat, or you can feel free to unmute and ask your question uh, if you would like. I'll give it just a, a little bit of wait time for that. Well, while, while you all are maybe hopefully someone's thinking about a question, I have a, I have a question for you. Um, you, you talked about uh, one of my questions was going to be, but you kind of answered it, just the idea of uh, the role of small group and whole group instruction and structured literacy in tier one. And you kind of kind of address that. My question is, um, what what are your recommendations around like what data would you use to drive those flexible groupings in terms of what you're focusing on? Where where do you get that data? What does that look like? Um, what, what, what do you see for that? So I would say, you know, in the early grades, um, you know, because it's so common that poor decoding is at the root of many uh, reading problems in the early grades. In the early grades, the research shows that, I don't know, something like 80 to 90 percent have of poor readers have problems that revolve around decoding. Sometimes it's decoding only, sometimes it's decoding, you know, plus comprehension. Um, that shifts in the later grades. So, but in the, in the primary grades, like K to three, um, I would say measures around decoding, both uh, out of context word decoding and, you know, reading in a book. So is the child reading accurately in a book? And then um, think you look at things like, it could include also, you know, observational types of measures, like some children read accurately accurately and they they're good about self corrections which suggests they're monitoring comprehension but re reading is really labor there's a lot of labor that goes into it so then the teacher might decide the child needs to be at an easier level or something like that um cbm can be really useful um it, for you know progress monitoring and deciding um uh, placement in small flexible groups. So that sort of thing is probably what I would look at in the earliest, you know, grades. And then as the kids get more to a middle elementary grade, still the, some of the things I've already mentioned are still useful at that grade level, but then maybe a little bit more in relation to, you know, embedded comprehension checks in the 
books that children are reading for instruction, um, IRIs, informal reading inventories can sometimes be um, useful. You can't really use those on a like weekly basis or anything, but on a little bit longer, you know, couple times a year or something like that uh, can be useful. CBM, maze CBMs for comprehension uh, could be useful. So, um, you know, as the children get into the middle elementary grades and you see more children who have that profile of problems with comprehension, again, either by itself or sometimes in, in combination with poor decoding, um, the maze CBMs could be especially useful. Yeah, and that's uh, here in Oregon, at least I know we have uh, in many states do have dyslexia legislation where we're required to do um, screening uh, for all kids and typically in the early grades that is CBM so you know we see a lot of schools using those at least for the initial groupings, especially at K2 um, to drive some of that. Yeah, one thing I would say about the CBMs that I don't know, you know, you all might be better about this than what I see in my own state, but it's really common that people that I see here just look at rate, but it's really important to look at accuracy as well. Um, and it's often harder for the kids to build rate, but if you're seeing improvements in accuracy, that's really important. And if you have rate gains, but accuracy is not great, then that's not a good thing. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I would, uh, that would be my, my one suggestion, but the CBMs are extremely useful. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction. We do uh, encourage people to look at accuracy before rate because we need to be accurate before we're uh, proficient readers. And one kind of question, and there's some questions coming in. I want to get to as many of these as possible. One question that kind of tied on to that a little bit is, um, what are your thoughts about iReady uh, and other online instruction at, as an RTI method at any level? Are you familiar with iReady? And I, you know, I, I have heard of it. Um, I'm not familiar enough with it to really make a judgment. I think that um, you know the online things can be helpful to a point if they're being used for practice, say. Um, so as a supplement, you know, we're talking something that's an intervention, right? Not an assessment. So so as a um, as a supplement, depending on how it's structured, could be those kinds of online things can be useful. But I do think for children with more significant weaknesses, um, you, you typically need you know, the instruction with a teacher. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a couple questions around just curriculum. And I know, you know recommending curriculum is always a, a slippery slope, um, but do you have any suggestions on like resources or where people could go to look at a curriculum that might align more with structured literacy rather than a balanced literacy approach. So um, there are there are some online resources. Um, I think there used to be one. Actually, University of Oregon, I think, used to have one for reviewing curriculum. You know, for that's kind of the one thing I'm thinking of is kind of old, um, but was still good. And I think also um, FCRR has, you know, Florida Center for Reading Research has published some things, um, UT Austin, um, not, these are not that they publish curricula, but they uh, sort of provide a framework for schools to evaluate their choices of curriculum that could be helpful for people to look at. Yeah, and, and we've seen some uh, some states also have some nice reviews. I know Louisiana has done a nice job of reviewing some some popular curriculum and giving their input. Ed Reports is another resource that yeah. I know I've seen people go to to look yeah. at. Um, obviously, I I think we'd all kind of agree that you know we want to not just take what they say and buy yeah. something, but do yeah. our own research on it. But I think it's at least a start for yeah, people to get an idea. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, another question, you mentioned older struggling readers might not uh, need decodable text because they may be familiar with necessary phonics concepts. We're often wondering what the tipping point is in terms of mastered phonics concepts that can move them from decodable readers to authentic texts. Oh, it's so interesting. I did a version of this talk recently and I, that was like a, the big question that I got. So this is something people are thinking about, I guess. Um, so I don't know of any, you know, kind of hard and fast rule for this, 
But I would say um, when you have children who are able to decode a lot of the one syllable patterns. So if you're using a typical phonics sequence where the kids learn, you know, short vowel words and then magic E and then vowel R and vowel T, once they can decode a lot of the one syllable patterns, they should have the skills they need to read kind of more natural, like uncontrolled text at their instructional level, not necessarily at their grade placement. Um, but that could vary depending on the student. So some students, you know, have a good bank of sight word knowledge and they can function well in texts that aren't controlled. Um, the bottom line is when you think a student is ready, I would try them in something that is uncontrolled and then just assess how they're doing. And you usually look for, if you're a first grade teacher and you're looking, well, you're probably not gonna do, I'm not sure you're gonna do this with first grade, but first grade maybe around 90% word accuracy. As you get into the middle grades, a uh, higher level of word accuracy. You can see this, by the way, if you look on the Dibbles measures, their benchmark cutoff for accuracy for the child not to be at risk goes up. Um, so it's kind of like a sliding scale. So if you're a fifth grade teacher, 90% word accuracy is not really instructional level. But anyway, I would be looking, I would assess, and if it seems like the book is too hard, then think about using either an easier, uncontrolled text or going back to the decodables. I think um, my experience is that with text, you kind of have to do a lot of experimentation. So the assessments are really helpful in giving you like kind of an educated guess, a starting point. But you kind of have to experiment a little bit. And I know some of this, you know, the feasibility, it's harder for the gen ed teachers than if you're maybe a special ed teacher or remedial reading teacher. But um, the right book is pretty important. So it's worth kind of, you know, trying different books and seeing how children do because variables like the child's background knowledge or their motivation for reading a particular book can also, you know, make a difference.